Hello and welcome to the Deep NBA Podcast. My name's Sean and joining me as always is the one and only Dante Buff from Mr. Buffalo. How are we? Well, it's not as always anymore, uh, but it's good Dante. to be back in the saddle. <laughs> it's good to be back in the saddle, I'll tell you that much. It's, it, it actually... It's. I don't know how to start the other pods. Do you, as the person whose name sake it is when I say that at the start of the deep two, um, do you have any ideas for what happens when I have a different host on? No, because I think it has to be organic. Mm. And I would say that you, as the host du jour of this you know, extended universe for the last four and a half years, are the most qualified person to really feel it out feel out that introduction based on who the person who the you know who's sitting across from you mm. yeah if it's Marco you're going one way if it's Lucas you're going a different way mm. you know mm. but you got to trust the process dare I say and and trust that you'll be able to get to the point of equilibrium mm. fuck well said uh, I was also thinking of changing the intro music for other people but I don't think I should do that this is a little bit of behind the kimono. This is extremely behind the kimono. Um, I think I should keep the sound because the sound is TDT. What does uh, what does producer Jamey think? I haven't asked her slash him yet. Um, yeah, maybe I'll ask and get. Yeah, back. maybe yeah. we'll yeah. <laughs> I mean, we'll talk find, with the tech boffins. You've got to find it. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. As I said, back in the driver's seat, uh, boff times Carol. Um, yeah, the next dot point is a, a, a plug. But um, how you been, but? Yeah, pretty good. You and I have just been for a run. Mm. We went for a lovely run down by the Merry and through residential Thornbury. Shout out to residential Thornbury. It's a mm. beautiful part of the world. Mm. Mm. Uh, but wasn't that, wasn't that lovely? Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was the first time I've run with someone since I was 18 or 17 years old. Yeah. And I was like a little bit worried heading into it. I was just like, okay, I did a run yesterday and then on Monday I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm in... I'm in the middle of my week, even though it was such a crazy week. What with the Tuesday off? Wow, it really doesn't feel like a Thursday. <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm feeling pretty good, like, run-wise. Like, you know, I'm in the middle of the week. This is, like, my fittest. Um, but I was like, oh, fuck. What if Dante, who's only ever been lovely to me, just turns out to be an absolute prick and just says, <laughs> fuck it, if you can't keep her. <laughs> nah, I wasn't worried about that, but it was good. Um, I was worried about myself not being able to talk, but it was fine. You it was killed actually, it. It was actually fine. We were, we were in full conversational flow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, yeah, occasionally I had to go, <laughs> Chet Holmgren looks good. <laughs> we actually didn't talk about basketball. Yeah, we didn't talk about basketball we've, we've, one bit. We've got, a, we've got a pod to fucking talk about basketball, but yeah, great. We should, uh, we should do it again in maybe like, Four weeks, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we can do it before then. I'm around. I'm <laughs> yeah, around. you're around. And it's it's just having a shower just then. I was just like, fuck, maybe I could do a park run then. Have you ever done one of them? Like with like the, the group? The group, yeah. My brother's always trying to get me to do them. They, but they can't I don't... be doing it at 8am on a Saturday. Bro, that's the best time to run, seriously. Oh. Like, I hate to be one of those guys, but it's so <laughs> good to, to actually be up early on a Saturday and mm. just... And just running because then you because you make the most of the whole day holy fucking shit you sound like my mum and my dad if you run for an hour (laughs) an hour and a half on Saturday morning it's 9.30 and you're like you know in Brunswick getting a coffee Mm. whereas if you just live on a Saturday (laughs) morning there's a chance you might not even your feet might not not even have touched the floor by 9.30 and the difference that's a real difference yeah, look, the, the hours on the weekend are more valuable. Uh, Definitely. But, yeah, Definitely. It, it's made me think, like, yeah, I could... It's it's less threatening now I've done it with someone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe come down with me and, uh, me and the brother for a uh, for a park run if he can ever get me down there. I've been <laughs> extremely reluctant because I'm just like, we usually just run to the two of us. Mm. What's, pro- what's the problem with running together? You don't want to run with me anymore. You want to replace me with other people. Huh? My my brother trying to get me to go to the park run. No, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's he's pulling. I'm pushing. Then. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's also in the Mary. There's one in the Mary, but I think yeah. it starts in Northcote, my neck of wood. Yeah, there's one at Prinny as well. Prince Park, mini, yeah. p- mini ponds. No, Brunswick. Oh fuck, true. Like Queens Park, Queens Park. Queens you get in the Royal Parks confused, yeah, and then there's actually Royal Park between Mini Ponds <laughs> and Brunswick. Well, the whole time you've been saying because you've been talking about Prinny Park, I'm like, why is he going to Mini Ponds? Like, I guess. Because you grew up in Mooney Park. Yeah, yeah, you watch it. <laughs> watch um, it. But that's, a, that's as good a segue as any. Uh, firstly, <laughs> deep2.com, I can't believe it's that simple. Um, the most recent article up there is from Alessio Conte. It was a wonderfully and uniquely written article, and there's actually an article coming hopefully next week, so 
stay tuned on the deep com as well but Alessa's Alessa's knocking the the unique formula you just googled Jalen Williams we're talking about the deep <laughs> I'm multitasking <laughs> um, yeah so it's a conversation that he and his beautiful partner had when they went to a basketball game um, in America when they when they went like December last year was it? yeah, yeah uh, January I, I believe um, yeah and, and just <clears throat> Alessio a you know basketball slash sports super fan and then Alana um, not to dox him but Alana just a sports super fan um, went in you know only being positive going oh I can't wait to enjoy NBA basketball uh, and Aless might have eased her into the takes but she definitely had some takes about why are they stopping so much what's what's a media timeout um and unless just sort of breaks down all those questions uh and I'll, i won't i won't tease it anymore because i feel like i'm teasing a lot but unless just sort of does what he does perfectly and appropriately complain i think that's a good way to put it yeah well there's heaps of problems with uh with the structure and the mm. flow of nba basketball particularly for those of us who love watching the sport where it the play pretty much goes mm, mm. Uh, so yeah head on to the deep2.com I can't believe it's that simple mm. and, and check that out uh, and we've also got a couple of episodes up recently of the W Basketball Show with Lucas Petridis and the JVG Tribute Show well and Lucas Petridis and WNBA well, Champion I was getting there fuck, fuck, fuck. I was getting there <laughs> and the W Basketball Show in particular Kayla George. Mm. Kayla George. You may know from being a WNBA MVP and a WNBA champion. We may know her from being in Sydney last year watching <laughs> the Opals uh, run their way through the Women's World Cup and Kayla George just feasting on 15-foot middies. Mm. And Lucas being like, wow, it's such a repeatable shot. <laughs> it's such a repeatable shot. Her and Dirk. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> two of two. So anyway, check those out. Uh, you can find those on the website. You can find those at Apple Podcasts. You can find those at Spotify, wherever you get pretty your podcasts. Where, yeah. Pretty much wherever. Look um, for it. Google it if you have to. Find final, out. final, final plug before we get into it. Um, we have a newsletter. Marco's writing it. It's very good. Uh, it's coming out fortnightly, and you can sign up to our newsletter on various links on our socials, as well as if you go to the deep2.com on the top right hand side, there's a button, an orange button that says sign up to our newsletter. So if you could please fill out your details there to get everything done today, nice and delivered to your inbox uh, fortnightly. But <clears throat> podcast, podcast. We are catching up to do a podcast, and we're going to talk about three topics that we really want to talk about um there's obviously that big french guy far out there's the big american guy with the dice necklace because he bets on himself and the chin strap he's his team um and the indiana paces so let's let's kick it off with chet holmgren and the oklahoma city thunder now these sorry i will just say these are three things that you and i have been watching and are like you know highly interested in um we'll start off with chet holmgren's counting stats he is averaging this season now these are before today's games the 9th the 11th um these oh, no, 11. oh um counting wait, what stats wait, what, what, what's that uh uh housemate's birthday <laughs> um he's counting stats chet holmgren 17 points eight rebounds 2.7 assists that's quite a big number uh 2.4 blocks on 56 54 90 shooting 54 what number does it start with? Fucking hell. Uh, five. <laughs> Fuck. Um, advanced stats. He's got an 18.6% usage. He has got... I think he's leading all bigs with a 1.45.1 1, uh, points per shot attempt. Which is... That's absurd. That's fucked, yeah. Shooting over 50% on threes will help with that. Yeah, of course. And that's definitely going to come down. Um, he's shooting about half of his shots at the rim and around, I think it is spot on, 31% of them from behind the arc. Um, for bigs, he's actually shooting a cold 67% at the rim. Um, but he is the league leader among big men for three point percentage. Obviously, aforementioned five fucking four. Um, three point seven block percentage is in the ninety second percentile among bigs. So you can probably count them on your hand. The guys that are ahead of him. Um, bad rebounder. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, and then the final number I have here on your laptop. Um, on off defensive numbers he's around league average at uh, deterring shots in the paint um, and he's also around league average at uh, stopping shots at the paint and he's actually like hyper good at stopping three point attempts and makes which I think that might be a little bit of noise obviously we're less than 10 games into the season but you know let's just say it as it is he's one of the best at the moment big men at stopping uh, three point attempts, attempts and makes so where do you want to start with uh, the big chin strap <laughs> 
I mean, let's start with the chin strap. These blokes need to have... They need to not have so many yes men in their lives. <laughs> you need to have a no man in yeah. your life. You need to have a man that says, I don't know, bro. I know that you're nine. I know that you're 19 or 20 and you're growing facial hair for the first time. You think it looks cool, but you got to shave it. It looks terrible. Mm. They need those sort of people in their lives because otherwise they're rocking out in front of 10 million people around the world looking like, a fucking looking like an idiot. <laughs> and it's terrible because the biggest takeaway is that he, I think... You know, you just read the shooting numbers. He he looks he looks great, but I I think he's as advertised on defense. Is mm. the the biggest takeaway that I've had from watching him through the first eight games. You know, he he is that kind of uh, dominant, scary, like prime Sergi Barker from the weak side kind mm. of help defender. Mm. He knows exactly when to rotate. He's always kind of looming over the shoulder of a driver. Um, and he's also got that ability to hang with guards out on the perimeter. Like, he, he he doesn't look panicked when he gets switched onto smaller players. He's able to stick with them. And when he can't keep them in front of him, he's he's got that length and that timing to be able to impact shots, hmm. block shots from behind. Um, yeah, I think you have to be really encouraged to see that that element of his game has just been as advertised plug and play from the get-go because so many big men you see who it's like you know look at Jabari Smith Jr. last year as a rookie mm. it's like wow this guy's calling card is going to be his defense and then he turned <laughs> out to actually be pretty shit mm. you know like he, he's, 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 uh, he's got a long way to go Jabari Smith Jr. not 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 making a long term comment at all but you see these highly drafted rookie big men come in and rarely are they actually plus defenders and it appears that <coughs> from the jump Chet mm. is going to be that and Chet had a tiny advantage obviously missed the missed the, his whole entire rookie season with the Liz Frank Liz um, Frank <laughs> she's a cruel mistress um, and like you could say yeah he's just been studying the film in an NBA environment but you know even even when we see people do this like yeah you're right he completely comes in and he's defending at a high level like at an absolute elite level and he's had some great quotes where it's not like Hassan Whiteside comes in and he's got an incredible rim protecting number um, and he's obviously swatting it into the fifth row and I think this is very much talked about but I feel like you and I should talk about it because we just I assume you love it as much as I how he said that when he's when he's been practicing blocking the ball all through like college and then now in the NBA his main goal after getting the block is keeping the ball in bounds because he just knows how how um how much it can juice the offense to get those transition um, transition attempts off a block shot because if you can control where the ball goes, you'll give it to your player. All of a sudden, you've got five dudes' momentum who just has to go the other direction uh, on the defensive on the defensive end, um, and that's just fucking like incredible amounts of maturity for a teenager. Well, and you're you know that's it's maturity, but you're saying that pay dividends right away because yeah. they the Thunder rank second in offensive efficiency off of live ball turnovers in transition. Mm. So they're keeping the ball he's keeping the ball in and they're running. Cuz what they've done is they've just kind of they've taken the Toronto Raptors approach but made everyone two inches shorter. <laughs> it's like, what if we just have every single player mm. is between six four and six seven, and then we have we have a big. Yeah, and 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 they're they're they're, they're running. Everyone everyone is just getting after it. So Chet being able to you know impact shots, and then when he is blocking shots, keep it in. It's like mm. awesome. Mm, it's, mm. it's it's being hit ahead, and now Jalen Williams is dunking it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also one one thing that's also uh, again mature is that if he got maybe drafted by the Charlotte Hornets. They might be running like you know heaps of post ups for him. They might mm. be running like you know intentional, uh, intentional pick and roll actions where it's like okay, the whole point is to get Chet the ball where he wants it. But Chet's playing like such a complimentary role on offense, and he's coming in as a great shooter. Obviously, he's shooting fifty four percent, that's not going to sustain. But like it's quite good that he's, his stroke looks good. He's taller than ever, and he's shooting the ball over. Yeah, if he's shooting fifty four percent through his first eight games from three, he will be shooting thirty seven percent by the end of the year. You know. For, for a, a good chunk of his career like it yeah. seems clear that he is a good shooter this should be his worst 
first time today and then it's yeah, just going to exactly, get better. Exactly. Um, but yeah, for, for OKC's offense, it's like he sort of just seamlessly uh, slipped in because there's obviously been quite a lot of coverage about their like inverted pick and rolls where they get their like tricky big man, like, you know, the Jay Will, the big one, um, to act as like the ball handler or maybe he's the guy who's like catching the, catching the kick out three and there's a lot of like guard, guard pick and rolls. Shea obviously spends most of his life running downhill. Jalen Williams as well. Also Jalen Williams, which we're going to talk about. I just love that he like turns his shoulder and he just sort of like stumbles down into the paint and it's so and it's just perfect for what they want to do um, with Mark Dagnalt's offense um, and it's not like Chet is the guy always sitting the screens and Chet I think he's had like less than five post-ups on the year I was looking at it on bucket list top fans before um, <laughs> and they are just flaming hot pieces of garbage where it's like oh my god we've just haven't we haven't been able to manufacture a good possession Chet you know do a fade away and like he made his first one in um or one of his early ones in his in his debut game, and it's like, oh look, he can do this, but it's like this, they're not going to do that because they've got playoff aspirations. Yeah. And he's a shooter, and their best players are, you know, it's Isaiah Joe sitting a screen for Shea, and they're more than happy doing that. And if it's not that, it's Josh Giddy or it's Jay Will. Yeah. And Chet, they're just like, look, I know you might be one of the best rookies in recent history, but you are a rookie. You're going to stand behind the three point line, and he's, he's shooting a lot of above the arc three points. Which is also great because you want him defending the rim. So if he's above the arc, he's closer to the rim than he has to defend eventually to run back on defense. Yeah. Um, all's all's wonderful, um, both from a chemistry point of view, both from a prospect point of view, both in a team fit point of view. I wasn't this high on Chet heading into the season. Um, obviously, when we did our season predictions for the deep a couple of if it's that simple, I didn't even mention him when it came to Rookie of the Year. Obviously, we all... We, we, picked, <laughs> a, we picked who's going to come second in Rookie of the Year. Yeah, and like it's definitely Chet, I would say. Are we saying definitely Chet? Who's, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think by, you know, by, I mean, by a, a wide margin. I don't want to tell you who I picked. Who'd you pick again? Chet. Oh, did you? Yeah. I mean, I had Scoot and fucking... I, I guess I'm like, oh, he had a sprained ankle for the first five games <laughs> yeah, that only came out in game that's, six. That's the one. That's um, the one. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I think, you know, talking about his role in the offense being quite complimentary, like that will come as he... Um, gets more comfortable and gets more reps under his belt. But the thing that the thing that is is also there offensively, like he's a great shooter. Uh, he his his ball handling is is really good as well. Mm. Like not only in the half court where he's had some really nice tricky handles, but he's actually like kind of quite tight got quite a tight quite a tight handle, mm. excuse me, in the half court. And when he's getting closed out hard, he is going to be able to just kind of take a couple dribbles and get downhill mm. um, and you know you, you made a little quip about his you know averaging almost three three assists a game for a rookie center through his first you know eight or so games and that's that's really good yeah, that's, yeah. that number's only going to go up as well mm. uh, he sees the floor really well and he doesn't hesitate or take too long with his decisions it's either like all right I'm going hard after this closeout or I'm shooting or I'm making this first read pass mm. keeps it simple they're not asking him to do too much and he's just like really fucking nailing it offensively mm. in that kind of simplified stripped down role but there's no point in asking him to do more when he has this frame mm. at the moment like you can't throw the ball to him in the post and you shouldn't mm. no skinny guy has ever had you know, like the sort of overwhelming success on a good team that you want from a post player in the modern mm. the modern day. If you're going to throw it into the post, there's pretty much two guys in the league who you want to throw the ball into the post. One's in Philly and one's in Denver. Um, and, you know, the rest of them are your, your Dallas, Kristaps, Porzingis kind of post diets of just, yeah, like you said, skinny guys taking two dribbles, realizing they can't get all the way to the rim and then fading. Mm, mm. Um, and, and on his skinny, I feel like we've been very complimentary. And yes, like he, he is quite ambitious with his passes, but he does rack up the turnovers. But yeah, he just, in the game that I watched recently against the New Orleans Pelicans, he just got eaten alive by JV. And JV, obviously, one of the bigger, more burly centers in the league. Um, and that's just going to happen. And that's just him as a rookie. And it's like, okay, I guess Oklahoma aren't going to win the fucking title this year. Five years from now, they're looking pretty good because the signs are great. The signs are all there. They've got all these dudes locked in, whether that be SGA or whether that be um, rookies who are just going to like, get uh, re-signed on their current deals. Um, but yeah, he does get fucking eight. 
Um, we haven't seen Denver versed OKC yet. Also, just I just want to see Jokic just do this against like um, both the skinny guys who we're going to talk about, Chet and Wemby. Yeah, well, I feel like he'll. I feel like he'll put Chet in the ground, like Undertaker <laughs> style. Mm-hmm. But I mean, Wemby. Who knows? Because the thing with, I mean, we'll get to it. But the thing with Wemby is, it's like okay, well, whatever you can say about Chet you just have to tack on an extra three inches and hide an extra four inches yeah, and yeah, yeah. for Wemby. It's like, well, okay, maybe Nikola Jokic can bump you back, but you're still seven foot five. Yeah, we've seen him get pushed back in the chest, but his arms are long enough to yeah. come down. Yeah. But like the the fact that um like today, excellent game against the Golden State Warriors and uh Kevon Looney, veteran center it makes minimal mistakes and he racked up like three there was the, his final three fouls I think he ended the game with four fouls mm, he, does, fin- he has been fouling a lot but this season like Jokic was just coming in Jokic is just like looking down the death chart and he's like oh you've got a rookie centre coming off the bench who's like 6, 9 on a good day um, I'm going to get this guy in foul trouble and then I can just fucking eat against the Trace Jackson Davies dude <laughs> and he fucking did and it was like Yes, Looney has been failing this season, but like he just like he was absolutely hopeless, and I yeah. just can't wait to see Jokic do it against some young dudes. Yeah. Um, more broadly, Oklahoma. Where do you want to start? Well, I think the thing you know, using Chet as a jumping off point that I, f- I found really interesting for this team through the first five games is that they have not fucked around at all mm. with Chet in two big lineups. They haven't been like, oh, we don't want to save him the. You know, yeah, yeah. We, we don't want to save him the miles. We're not gonna. We're not gonna play him at the five. He has played every single minute of this young season as a five, mm. and as a result, their offense is so fucking good. As a result, their rebounding is so <laughs> fucking bad. Mm. They're they're the worst offensive and defensive rebounding team in the league, mm. and the the dudes that Chet is playing against are just always bigger and stronger than him mm. not not taller because obviously he's seven foot whatever but bigger and stronger and it's like you, you know Chet versus Bismack Biombo. Bismack Biombo is going to get the rebound mm. let alone guys who have actually been in the league before the last three games and they were signed off the street mm. um, which is a real problem they're giving up the, they've got the lowest they've got the lowest defensive rebounding rate in the league um, and they're actually seventh in the league in opposing effective field goal percentage, which is really, really, really good. They just can't get <laughs> rebounds. They're hemorrhaging mm. offensive rebounds, which means that they're just giving up double. They're giving up second chance points and you know, two shot possessions and stuff like that. So their D has kind of struggled because of it. But I think it's really promising that they're just like, okay, our, you know, our championship team our Western Conference Finals trip next year is going to have Chet as a five. We're mm. just going to play Chet as a five now. We're not going to try and blood him, which is not something that you really see any, yeah. you know, in the last 10 years, like any four slash five has come into, that's come into the league. They've been a four mm. as a rookie. Mm. That's what the Spurs are doing with Wemby. That's know? what, you know, the Grizzlies did with Jaron Jackson. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, the... Um, the Pelicans did it with Davis for years mm. and years and years. Mm. You know, mm. they're just like, Chet, you are a five. You're going to play the five. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty fucking good. Uh, I don't have many more comments to make on the defense because you've hit everything on the head. But do you, do you want to talk more about the defense or do you want to move on to the offense? Yeah, let's talk about the offense. Um, yeah, SGA was my pick for MVP and he's doing everything I thought he would do. Yeah. Um, he he wasn't my pick in fantasy. I drafted Tyrese Halliburton above him and I'm not sure if that's... What was your first pick? Third, yeah. I yeah. had the third pick. You took Tyrese Halliburton third? Yeah. That's crazy talk, bro. He's averaging 24 and 12. Yeah. <laughs> With two steals. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. It's like, would you rather 24 and 12 or 30 and 5? I took Devin Booker with my first pick and then I traded him. Yeah, for Jamal Murray, who's out for, <laughs> for the rest of the month. Came out today. It's a funny old life. <laughs> it's the rest I thought of it the month. A, wait, this month has just started. Yeah, I know. It's a grand old flag. Also, like, since when Since when are hamstring injuries, yeah. like, only two weeks? It's, like, of course he's going to be out for th- three to four weeks minimum. It's a fucking hamstring. It's it's weird. I, I don't it's know. It's like these blokes have never watched AFL football. Mm, some of them haven't. Well, Murray has. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Giddy, J Dub, Casson Wallace. Casson Wallace looks really, really good. Isn't it so fun that he's just like the most redundant player in terms of size and position and skill set that you could possibly have put on this roster <laughs> but they're just playing him anyway and they're yeah. just stacking strength on strength on strength yeah, they're like hey yeah. what if there's another wing sized guard who can dribble and shoot yeah, and we're gonna yeah. play him with our other wing sized guards who can dribble and shoot I can't believe he's playing so well and he came like the first game of the season he was playing rotation minutes so was Osman Jing and they, I, they I, picked where they pick him they picked him like 7th they like, picked it was him high. I believe it was 10th they yeah. traded because they had the 10th pick and Dallas no they had the 12th pick Dallas had the 10th pick and they traded um, it was a celery dump of Davis Bertans yeah, from, and yeah, then um, was tenth. You're right. And then Dallas got the um, Derek Lively pick. Who Derek Lively was good. Yeah. Um, after the opening night of the season, he was actually leading in Rookie of the Year. No longer. Um, but uh, yeah, time but is a fickle mistress. They they picked up thirteen million dollars of Davis Bertans to move up two picks, which was criticised by all the podcasts I listen to. And now when the camera pans to Davis Bertans, it's just like, bro. That dude, that Ranga's got to sit on your bench for a year and you got a better player for the next eight years. Well, and That's, also, like, not for nothing. He can shoot. He can shoot. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, like there'll be a mo- there'll be a Davis Bertans mm. moment this year. There, I, really there, th- I thought there would be, but... There will be. It's a long season, bro. It's a long yeah. season, and to be honest... The, there wasn't last year. <laughs> one, of, one of the reasons, potentially, you know, I, I do think the main reason why Chet is playing the five is because they're saying, like I said, this team is going to succeed with Chet at the five. We're going to blood you early. You look at the other bigs on the roster, it's not exactly a murderer's row. You've yeah. got Usman Jeng and you've got Olivier Saar, yeah, yeah. who he looks really good every time he uh you know, every time he plays, he's just for the bloody Oklahoma City blue. <laughs> he's just jumping for everything and like yeah. you know, dunking and blocking shots and rebounding. Yeah. Uh, no, no, playing no. eight minutes a game. So yeah. clearly he doesn't have the, the, the trust. Mm. Um and, but there could be a way for Bertans to get minutes at the four. Like there just definitely could be. Is Poku out for the season or like six weeks? Is he is he uh, out? Look, I thought he was I, I haven't I, thought I, about him in forever. Yeah, years. I believe he got injured in preseason. Oh, that's it also doesn't matter. Yeah, um, no, it doesn't. Yeah, guards. It's it's pretty fucking cool. But in watching the offense, it's like it's incredible. SGA penetrate kick. It's either a shot or there's a right into a dribble handoff where Jay Dubs getting a penetrate and a kick, and then Shea's back out there. Shea's shot looks fucking incredible, and also Shea going practically horizontal with the ground and then pulling it back for a step back three and he's making his threes. He's so good. He's he's my MVP this year. <laughs> um, and uh, we've talked about this in the past. I don't think Josh Giddy fits. Um, I disagree with you. Right. Well, I, I just think he's too... Yes, if he gets the ball and makes a quick decision, that's incredible. Like He's the greatest glue with the mullet and a uh, fucking five o'clock shadow you've ever seen. But I just don't like because he's not dynamic enough to to take part in that drive and kick game. They're not using him as an operator really. They don't really like using pick and roll in a traditional way. He's just sort of an overpriced, and I say overpriced because he's going to have to get a big contract as his next deal and over invested because they drafted him sixth. He's an overpriced, over invested glue piece. Which I just I'm also thinking about his next contract. I, I shudder to think what his next contract is. Um, not because I think it's going to be terribly bad, but I think it's going to like, it might start with an eight or something. And it's like, I don't... It'll de- an eight? Yeah. Bro, it's going to start with a one. You reckon? That's, Absolutely, that's it's going to start with a one. That's too much money. I mean, to be fair, I, I meant 800. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's too much money. No, I think that, I, I think that one, it's not too much money at all. I think that B, it's... Um, definitely going to be that much. A hundred percent. What? Fucking DeAndre Hunter. Yeah, okay. He's only, <laughs> he, he starts with a nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are we... What, Three years ago. Yeah, what are we talking yeah. about? Of course he's going to start with a one. Yeah, I just fucking... Uh, but what's what's Josh... When this team's a title contender and Chet's fucking the biggest cunt in the world and he can defend, like, Nikola Jokic in the post, You what's Giddy do? You don't need to know that. Okay. Giddy... He'll be extension eligible this season. This off season. And then have one more year and then a qualifying offer. So you've got two and a half more years of team control at an absolute minimum. And mm-hmm. then you can still extend him if you don't know. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you extend him and he'll still have trade value. So why, why do you like a, him? 
Well, I like him because A, he's really big and that lets him do things both offensively and defensively that a lot of other guards can't. Mm-hmm. I think he's got a genuinely really good post game, which is something that other players who will be factored into their team's off- offense as like just standing in the dunker's spot, mm-hmm. a lot of them don't have any post game to speak of. And while he is sometimes being marginalized, like marginalized in air quotes, standing in the dunker's spot, with Chet there spacing the floor or rim rolling mm. you can kind of swing it around to Gideon he's got a small defender on him a lot of the time but he can just like mash that dude and get close to the cup he's not a great finisher inside for someone his height but he's in his third year like that that'll probably mm, come mm. and you you said it he's, he's, he's the glue he's a connector he makes the right read every single time he's hitting ahead in transition he like he he has that kind of point guard mentality of like knowing where and when someone needs it hitting their players in the exact right pocket for their shot Mm. being like okay I gotta get this guy the ball Uh, I think having someone with those skills next to someone like Shea is really good because Shea is just fucking gonna average 30 points a game for the rest of his career it seems Mm -hmm. but Giddy has those you know the the true point guard skills that um, Mm. that no one else on this team has look I really fell in love with him yeah, during the World Cup where like you're watching him and he's, he's got that sort of like Jokic thing in him where it's like oh he's going to find the open man I, I don't have to sit there and go he's open in the corner you just know he's going to give it to the right person at the right time and like a lot of the time you can't actually see that pass he waits a second or he waits a beat and all of a sudden it's like a wide open shot under the rim um, i just seen too many offloaders and then as the balls bounced off the rim he's just pushed his hair back with two hands I don't know you don't think he's got that dog in him? No, nah, not the dog. The hair's a bit of a joke, like <laughs> what I just said. Yeah. I just, you just, he misses a lot of layups. He's not a good finisher. That's yeah. that's for sure. But he's six foot eight, and that will come with time. Yeah, I would, I, I would make the bet. I would, I would, you know, sitting here now, in tw- in late twenty twenty three, I would not blink at paying him a hundred million dollars in. To, in 18 months time yeah four years 100 million dollars done I would sign it I would sign it you know in a heartbeat yeah at the very least if if push comes to shove and you say Shay is going to be here Jalen Williams has developed into like a fringe all star level player that's like you've got the starting two guard locked up forever Casey Wallace we've got an extra two years of team control on him and he's really really good mm. uh, you know he's your first guard off the bench he's your first guard off the bench like we don't need Giddy we can't invest you know a hundred million dollars in our third or fourth guard mm. he he will have trade value someone around the league will will want mm. him and in the meantime like what do you lose by what do you lose by yeah. holding on to him uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying trade him right now yeah. I'm just I'm thinking yeah. far in the future yeah but like yeah if he like I mean, if he learns to either A, finish at the rim, which I think will come, or become a really good shooter, mm. then yeah, it looks then done. It looks he, he just needs to get one of those to in, or, in order to be like yeah. a, a major, major, major plus player, I think. And like, if he could be like a, if he could be like a Joe Ingles defender, not, which not, again, not to compare like, white he's, Australians. He's, he, he's big. You just have to be in the right place. Mm, mm. You just have to be there and and you will make life hard for your opponent speaking of big and in the right place let's talk about that French kid that French kid Victor Wembanyama, counting stats this year 19.4 8.4 sorry points rebounds uh, 1.7 assists 2.6 blocks on 46 32 75 shooting uh, advanced stats word I forgot to get them today um, Victor Wembanyama, uh, you might have seen him if <laughs> you probably have because he's quite big yeah uh, he he shoots a lot he yeah. loves the sound of his own jump shot yeah. I reckon and I think that's also because he's doing what you congratulate Mark Dudnoff doing where he's like oh okay we have to play him with the centre so he doesn't fucking get reps as a fucking centre which is where he's going to be when he grows up and it's not like Jaron Jackson Jr. started his career with Mark Gasol and it's like he's learning so much and Mark Gasol's just pushing him saying go there it's Zach Collins yeah Zach Collins is really bad at basketball 
Um, and yeah, he's having a fine season, I guess. But it's it's not going to be what the the end goal is. Maybe that's a pot problem. Maybe that's a Victor problem. I, I, I don't know. But um, maybe it's a roster construction problem. Um, but because he's at the four and there is someone always in the paint, because even if Zach Collins wants to space out to the mid-range, no one's respecting him there. You can have that shot a hundred times a game. Um, Victor, I feel like he's, he's felt the need to shoot and he's felt the need to jack and he's felt the need to float around the three-point line. And while we congratulate um, Holmgren for doing that and Holmgren for spacing out the floor for his good drivers and like, yes, you know, Holmgren's got the, you know, a team that made the play-in and won a game in the play-in last season. So there's a little bit of like, a little bit of, uh, uh, what would you call it? Like a little bit of rank and file in Oklahoma where it's like obviously Shea's first team All-NBA. Yeah, but I would say that Chet's shot diet is pretty much exactly where you want it to be where he's yeah. taking half his shots at the rim and over a quarter of his shots from three but Victor needs to take more shots in the paint he needs to take more shots in the paint and more shots from three he he he, he loves those middies yeah and which he, it could also be a result of Sohan's his point guard and like it's hard well, to well I mean this is not shot. a healthy offensive ecosystem no. I think what's clear to me is that he is forcing it like definitely he's hmm He's not shooting too much. I would really hesitate to frame it that way, but he needs to reorient where those, sh- where and when those shots are coming from. And at the same time, the only person on this team who knows how to find him is Trey Jones. Yeah, the, that like like none of the other players have kind of figured out where and when to get him the ball mm-hmm. to the point where he's like kind of trailing towards the rim on, in a semi-transition and it's like you just need to throw the ball yeah, at the rim yeah. and he has a dunk it doesn't yeah. matter who is there and they're not yeah, they're yeah. not looking for it yeah it's and like they're not looking for it whereas like yeah Trey Trey Jones will and once Trey Jones starts to start it's gonna they're, they're gonna build that chemistry and not that Trey Jones is the be all and end all but yeah as you said he's the only Trey Jones is just like an average yeah, he point just, guard. Like he's he, probably not actually a starting point guard on twenty seven uh, I think he is. I I think he's a, he's a good defender, which gets him onto a twenty seven ten. I'm not. But that, not yeah. Not we're not, that we're that not here talking about that. Yeah. Uh, so man, hand. I ate so much garlic. I just did a burp and it was practically a bulb. Oh, hold my nose. Um, so then is I mean it's it's so interesting. <laughs> right yeah that that opening day kind of comes around and it's like we're playing this second year power forward as the point guard yeah but he's playing point guard like a power forward yeah yeah yeah. yeah. he he just has no feel for I, I'm impressed with his dribble uh, like I oh he can he can he can yeah. dribble that's yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. Know, that's 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 great I, I could, thought that was going to be a problem so when I saw that in the first couple of games I was like man he's, he's got a tight dribble like he's getting around traffic but he's not making right decisions no he, he he can't shoot yeah and he doesn't have any feel for you know navigating a pick and roll or mm. like you know timing in the offense or mm, anything mm. Like, it's it's just gummy yeah he, I, he I, takes the first 10 seconds of the possession and then once he gets rid of the ball it's like okay, <laughs> maybe now something starts to happen and, yeah I and I, I messaged friend of the program and resident Spurs fan Jackson Leach um, after watching a couple of games and I was like hey man just like just want to let you know these are my thoughts because I feel like everyone wants to know my thoughts so I better cold they, they message do, they them they do they do always um, and they love it when you volunteer and then I was like look the Sohan shit when he puts up a bad shot he also is taller than the person guarding him, so he rebounds his own shot. Maybe that's something you could exploit. It's it's so fucking minimal <laughs> <laughs> that when he misses the shot, if it happens to come back to him, he yeah, he's probably getting it right. Yeah. Like, but no, it's 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 an experiment that needs to stop. And and Greg Popovich has said, look, when we said we were going to do this at the start of the year, we knew that we'd take our lumps. But I think Trey Jones is like third in the league in plus minus. Not because he's the third best player or the third most efficient player, but because like Sohan's like negative fifteen or offense and defense, and then Trey Jones just comes in and he's like an average point guard, yeah, uh, who's just like a flat lining on one hundred, yeah. And Sohan is is a good athlete without being like super explosive or like laterally quick. Mm. Not that he's not, but I mean, I wouldn't want him defending point guards. I don't want him defending point guards. It seems clear to me that his best position defensively will be to have him as, you know, like your wing stopper. Aaron Gordon. Yeah, Aaron Gordon. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. Like that, that's, that's what you want him to, 
to kind of be like you can defend guards in a pinch, but you don't. Yeah. You, you want him to be defending Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so having him play point guard without Trey Jones on the floor or without another point guard on the floor, like it just causes problems for you defensively as well because mm. it's like who's guarding the point guards? Mm, mm. You know, then you are, are you is he still guarding the wing and then you're sliding other people down and it's like all of a sudden, <coughs> you know, like is Malachi Branham. Or Keldon Johnson having to be the guy yeah, that's guarding yeah. the point guard, and that's not good either. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think like Devin Vassell is having a good season. Uh, he's I wrote the article on him, which you can find on the deep two um, He's he's definitely hunting for his own shot, and he's made it clear as of his second summer league that he's a dude who's going to hunt for his own shot, and he can make him. And he's made some tough shots, and you know he started off absolutely on fire, and he's come down to earth a little bit. Um, and on fire was 100% at the rim. Ah, oh, six or six attempts, right? <laughs> and it's like, that's cool that he's made them, but, you know, what are we going to look like when you've taken 100 shots? Um, I just, uh, I wish he wouldn't look for a shot as much, but then that's also what makes him who he is. And if, if we are going to explore the studio space and we are going to see how good he can be, and if he can be Devin Booker, he has to have that mentality this season. But we've, we've all seen the clips on YouTube. We've all seen the talking heads on Instagram and stuff. There's passes to be thrown to Wemby. He's five inches taller than the tallest person on your favorite basketball team. He's going to catch it. Like he, There was even that one that where the lob was thrown to Sohan and he pinched it off Sohan and then dunked it for him. Like... He's, the, the Spurs just need to get better at throwing him lobs. Um, and that could be Trey Jones coming to the starting line. Also, you can start Trey Jones. And uh, again, I feel like we're talking about him like he's a world beater. But <laughs> you can start Trey Jones and also just run stuff through Sohan. You don't have to not play a point guard if you're playing Sohan as well. Yeah, I mean, also Sohan could be the backup point guard. Yeah. And you stagger him to play when he's not with Wemby. You play yeah. Sohan with shooters. Yeah. But let, let's go back to Wemby. Um is it just that he needs point guard? Because, yeah, like, is is he a product of... Is he 32% on way too many threes? Is that, or in my opinion, is that a, um, a product of an unhealthy offense? Or is it... Like, I don't think it's a tendency problem for him. No, I don't think it is either. Um, and it's not something to be worried about because it's... He's he's going to be as good as advertised. Mm. That, that already is showing through. Mm-hmm. Like... Mm-hmm. You know what he did against the Suns in in the second of their back to back, yeah, thirty eight points and and ten straight in the fourth quarter like that. You are going to be an all star. Maybe you're going to be an all star this season. Like that, there's no doubt about that. So the health of the offensive ecosystem and what that does to his shot selection as a rookie is like kind of irrelevant. You would want him to be playing in a more healthy offensive ecosystem like obviously just because that's good but there's also probably a benefit in him searching out his own shot and figuring out what works and what doesn't Mm. figuring out that it's not Metropolitan's 92 and you're not going to get to your spot against a 6 foot 6 you know EuroLeague journeyman and Mm. be able to rise up for that jump shot that actually that's against a 7 footer and you are not going to be able to feast on on Mm. so you're going to have to figure out how to tighten your handle a little bit to be able to get to the rim because um, you know that hasn't actually been as advertised I think his half court handling has been pretty slack mm. I would say he hasn't been creating much for himself that's a part that's in, in part because of the spacing that we've been talking about not being there that offensive mm. you know the offense being gummed up but he's not you know clo- you know, going off a close out and getting all the way to the rim because of the strength of his own dribble. Mm-hmm. Um, so but hunting shots and taking a whole bunch of different shots is a good way to figure out what you can do, what you can't do, what you need to work on. So I think it's nothing to be worried about, but it is tempting to kind of say like, well, you know, what could this look like right away if you just got mm-hmm. him 48 minutes of good point guard play and some good shooting around mm-hmm. him? Um, and I think it was an early season thing and I haven't heard too much about it since, but... He just started the game not switched on. He just started the game like a little bit lackadaisical. Uh, it'll just come to me. And he just wasn't at full intensity from the start of the game. I feel quite bad talking shit about him like this because he's fucking, what, he's 15. like. Um, but yeah, just, I just, uh, maybe it's because he doesn't have a point guard that he's, he's going to throw on those, po- those passes. It's just so important that Pop gets this right. Um, I don't think there's any way that he could get it wrong. Yeah, okay. Like, I... I 
I think <laughs> you know it, it's been it's been uneven, but he's averaging twenty points a game mm. through his first eight games of the season. Like mm. he's going to be so fucking good. Yeah, and that's if even if Pop doesn't get it right this season or next season or at all before he retires, eventually someone is going to get it right, and he's then going to be like, oh, okay, like you're averaging thirty points in twelve. Yeah, uh, I'm being too nitpicky. I think like it's yeah. I it, mean, he's played, he's played eight games. Like, yeah, it's it's yeah. difficult to adjust expectations. For, it's it's just that Holmgren looks so good, and Holmgren is in such a Holmgren's beautiful not, situation. Yeah, he's not being asked to do yeah. anything like what Wemby is because yeah. he can't. To be honest, like Holmgren can't create his own shot the way that Wemby can yeah. already. Yeah, he can't handle the ball as a, you know like mm. a, a pseudo lead ball handler sometimes in semi transition mm. um, he just can't do that so Wemby's you know, it's a bit uneven but like the fact that he's able to do it with even occasionally good results is just so encouraging mm. uh, should we take a break before we talk about the Indiana Pacers yes we should this episode of the Deep 2 is presented by Gelateria Bico the official gelato of the Deep 2 Gelateria Bico, handmade gelato in the heart of Brunswick. You want to talk WNBA? Maybe some WNBL? Australian Opals chat? Heck, even dabble in some EuroLeague? Find the W Basketball Show on the Deep 2 Podcast Network. And we're back. Um, Indiana Pacers, the most efficient high scoring team in the NBA maybe even NBA history fuck it's eight games in a year, right? <laughs> um, does this shock you yeah it does definitely because you know obviously Tyrese Halliburton is the the latest guard to become a uh, point guard to, to, I was gonna there's only one point guard he's on your team he's on your team <laughs> Uh, I was going to paraphrase James Harden in like a less oh. cringe way, but to become the system. Mm. Halliburton is becoming the system. He he is, uh, you know, the 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 Chris Paul, Steph Curry, Trey Young to a less successful extent. <laughs> James Harden, like, we got this guy, we're going to play a certain way, mm. and this guy's going to elevate the role players, yada, 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 yada. Mm. The rest of the roster is pretty fucking average. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, yeah. But at least they can all shoot. Well, some of them can shoot, but they're, they're you know, like, Buddy Heald at, at this stage. You what know, the one, fuck do you mean? Buddy Heald is, sorry, if you, <laughs> Sean, if you'd let me finish. Buddy Heald is like one of the five best shooters of yeah. the last 10 years. Yeah. Like okay. that's. I thought you were bouncing the other way. With no, no, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm. he's a pretty limited offensive yeah. player at this point. So is, you know, Ben Matherin hey, is, is. He's always been limited <laughs> offensively. <laughs> Ben Matherin is uh, not really kicking on from last season yeah. as well as maybe we might have hoped. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty underwhelmed by the guys on the rest of this offense. There's no like difference making um, big like Miles Turner, Jarris Walker is not you know going to be someone who comes in and creates their own shot. So it's Halliburton creating shots for like average yeah, offensive Bruce players. Bruce Brown, yeah. Aaron Naismith. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm uninspired, but yet. Oh uh, yeah, they're doing Over quite well. You. Well, uh, yeah, they're doing well. Um, <laughs> they're 10th in point differential. <laughs> Seamless. 10th in point differential. They're second in offense behind Philly, which kind of shocks me. Um, They've got, Philly's got that one guy though. Yeah, but they were missing... The, who's their second best player for right? <laughs> They were missing... The guy with the beard. Um, 25th in free throw rate, which is quite scary because um, you know, free throw rate is usually something that determines how efficient and consistent your offense can be. Not necessarily, though. Yeah, you know. As a, as a fan of the modern era Phoenix Suns teams, yeah. I can tell you that that's not necessarily the case. Look, if you've got Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, <laughs> you can just put the ball in the basket. But we just listed Bruce Brown, Aaron Naismith. Um, also, that was what... Caitlin Cooper of Indie something, she she started her own blog, I believe, or is with some, some latest indie thing. She was doing the season previews um, pods, both with Nate Duncan and Danny Lurie on their own separate feeds. And I listened to both of them. Um, and she said, look, um, Benedict Matherin, like high volume last season, looks great because he's a rookie. And it's like, fuck it, go out there, average 16. Good on you, Chief, right? Yeah. But it's like, oh, he got to the free throw line like less than two times a game. Yeah. 
all of a sudden if you if you want to be good and you want to start like being the especially as him like an off the dribble scorer he's not the greatest shooter how's he going to like manufacture offense if you're not Devin Booker and Kevin Durant you can't just make every single shot ever yeah. you kind of need to do something else you need to diversify your offensive skill set the fact that he like no, not even like bad for a rookie bad for a human being couldn't get to the free throw line last season yeah. this season it's really come to the forefront because everyone's hitting their shots he's not that great of a shooter but then what does he do ah oh. I don't know. He looks cool. He's got a good cool name. Well, run in transition and try and get yourself some easy ones. Yeah, but, but fuck. Obadiah Topin does that. Yeah. But I mean, like, it's it's a weird one with, with Benny Mack because he's such a crazy athlete. Um, and, uh, no, nah, he's a really smooth, good. fluid mover. Like, yeah. he's... he's one of those guys, maybe maybe he doesn't have the highest vertical yeah, jump. But such a crazy. One he's of like those Zach guys Levine. that you, yeah, okay. So he's not Zach Levine, but he's, he's kind of he's like a he's like a he's like a mid career Paul George smooth mover. You know, mm, he mm, he just mm. kind of gets around quite well, and mm. it's like do that whilst dribbling the ball and get around to yeah. the rim, yeah, and shoot some fucking free throws. <laughs> Because if you yeah. can't if you can't make your threes and you can't you're, you're shooting congest, contested uh, deep twos, tick, um, <laughs> get some easy ones. Get yeah. four easy ones a game, and all of a sudden you're back at sixteen. Yeah. And then when your shooting picks up, you're at twenty. And it's just hard because like they've got the connector now and Bruce Brown, and they've obviously got Tyrese Halliburton, who is a system. Uh, and if Tyrese Halliburton isn't dribbling the ball and initiating offense, it better be for something fucking pretty good. Like it better be a wide open buddy heel three, or it better be Bruce Brown just finding a man. Because as soon as it's like, oh, well, now Tyrese Halliburton is a spacer, which he can do, but then you're wasting possessions. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the rest of the numbers. So, yeah, 25th in free throw rate. They're third in effective field goal percentage. So maybe the team is just going to be your Phoenix Suns. Um, where are they getting their shots from? They're near the bottom of the league in mid-range attempts, behind only the Cavs and the Bucks in terms of limiting mid-range attempts. Obviously, we've talked about the system Halliburton. Um, they're 14th in rim frequency. They're 8th in three-point frequency. They're 15th in rim accuracy, and they're 6th in three-point percentage. Team shooting 40% from three. That is buoyed, or buoyed, according to some Americans, no by uh, Tyrus Halliburton, Bruce Brown, Aaron Neesmith, Buddy Heald, and Miles Turner, who are all above 40% from three on a big enough attempt to get a color on cleaningoftheglass.com. Well, you know what? You say regression to the main or whatever as a standard response, but Halley and Heald are just fucking great you know, shooters. Yeah. Like, there's just no qualification needed. And Turner actually is is a like a you know a top four big man shooter in the league. Like, he he he, he could easily you know, make just a tick under 40 for his threes. Question. Yeah. Um, do you reckon Chet Holmgren, when it's all said or done, would have been better or worse than Miles Turner? Better. Way better. Yeah. Way, way better. better? Yeah. I don't I don't even think it's close. Okay. I, I, Miles Turner... Um, he can't dribble true. I completely forgot about he, that. Well, he can't dribble and he, 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 he never developed a post game even in that era of... Yeah. Pick Demantis Sabonis or me. I want to be the man. Yeah. Like he, he never like, you know, it's like, okay, show me why. He, he just wanted to be the man. Mm, mm. He's a really good shooter and a really good defender, but he also is not like mm. someone, not someone who I think is scheme flexible like Chet will be. He's a three and day big. Yeah. He's a, he's a three and day big who's like at the level of the screen or playing drop coverage. Yeah. Like Chet will be, a, already is able to like hang with wings on the perimeter. You know, mm, mm, mm. I think you know. Give it. I think give it three years, and Chet will be better than Miles Turner is now. I think you. I think you're right. Um, the Pacers are seventh in location e field goal percent percentage, which uh, scales based on how effective this metric believes it to be. Um, and Tyrese is leading the league by assisting on fifty percent of all the teams makes. That's including the time when Tyrese is sitting down. No, it doesn't. When he's on the court. Yeah, all assists it can't be yeah when he's on the court all the assists that are made he is doing one every second yeah um it's it's really good this is this is probably the the fucking top percentile outcome of how this Pacers team could be because you know that Tyrus Halliburton's good and he's going to get these guys open and they're just making their shots I just wonder where they go from here because unless Benedict Matherin pops there's no one else like Andrew Nembhardt might be a great backup and he's been forced to play the two a bit because he can shoot 
the there's no one else is here, no one else here is going to pop and the Pacers might just wedge themselves back into that six seed for the next seven years. I'm not too worried about it because they okay. own all of their own picks and they've got enough like interesting kind of players. I'm very future focused this episode. I'm like Josh Giddy, get rid of him now because eight <laughs> years from now he won't fit. I guess you're completely. No, right. I mean with a team that spent the last eight years being that. Being that the, the the fucking case study for the treadmill of mediocrity, it's mm. a very um, reasonable concern to have. But I think they own all their own picks. They've got like a, a Turner, a Brown, a, a Nemhard, a Heald, even a Benny Matt, depending on what happens there. That's six guys who, in theory, would have trade value yeah. to a contender. Who's to say, like? You know, fucking, I don't know. Who's to say Jalen Brown doesn't become available and it's like it's picks and a whole bunch of players or yeah. like, you know, Ananobi or there, there's a whole bunch of other like really good to great players mm. who could who could kind of make their way there via trade. Um, I think, that I think seems, Jalen Brown's a really good name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that seems to be the, the way that they would have to to do it right like probably no one's like Ananobi is a, is a free agent at the end of this season Siakam the end of next there's no one else in that kind of like amazing 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 role player fringe all star conversation who would you know come probably come there in free agency yeah right? yeah yeah so but I think they're well positioned to to you know they don't have a they don't have a hole but you might find that the teams that do have a hole, like Oklahoma City is not trading for Jalen Brown. Mm. So all of those picks that they've got like are not going to be leveraged against you in their... Mm. Um, mm. You know, Houston Houston might with all their picks. Pelicans. Pelicans, yeah. I mean, but yeah, now that we're getting into it, like some of those picks just aren't very valuable. Like, yeah, look, the Pels have the future of the Bucks and the future of the Lakers. But like that hasn't, apart from you know, 10 games into last season, they haven't looked like great picks to have. Um, yeah. Obviously, when the Lakers were 1-10 and 10 or whatever. Three paces picks and two good role players that are like salary salary matching. Like that, mm. that, that, that puts you in a conversation for someone. Yeah. You know? um, yeah, look, the, the sky isn't falling. Um, it's great that Tyrus Halliburton is like, let's say, in the MVP conversation. The, the Yeah, well, I mean, you know. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you... I didn't think that we'd be sitting here having this conversation, speaking about Halliburton the way that we are when they traded him for Sabonis. When yeah. they traded him for Sabonis. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, you know, unless God bless him, he was he was ahead of this on everyone. Obviously, watching more of Halliburton than any of us had, but he was saying like, essentially, fuck. Yeah. What the fuck I mean, are we I, doing he was like I think he stopped short of saying it but he was like you know of the mind of like trade Fox yeah keep Halliburton I think he said it well maybe, maybe <laughs> he said it uh, shout out to him if he did and I remember coming on you know coming on this very program and saying I don't get why everyone is freaking out like yes it's it's trading the future for a jut for right now, but there's no chance that, that Halliburton grows into a, a player that, you know, is miles, miles, miles better than Sabonis. Like, mm. even if he is better, like, Sabonis is still going to be really, really good. It's going to be mm. more or less an even, an even proposition. Mm. Uh, and that is just so wrong. I mean, it's worked out nicely for the Kings thus far but like Halliburton has become so fucking good mm. um, and, and yeah like I said at the, at the top just a system unto himself yeah. just want get, get this guy out there with decent NBA players and you will have a top five offense yeah which is pretty cool uh, and it's fun like it's fun also, to watch how, how old is he he's like 24 yeah it's it's so much fun um, god imagine if we had him instead of uh, James Wiseman Crazy, yeah. Then we Crazy would, then we wouldn't have needed Chris Paul. Man, how good would it have been if Lamelo Ball went to, went went to you as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a few guys actually. Yeah. In fact, almost everyone. Anyone except round. James Wiseman. Who is there? Anyone in the? Can you just Google the 2020? Uh, in that first round, is there anyone we would prefer James Wiseman to? Like, I there's got to be right. Fuck, it's got to it's got to be like a Euro stash. Okoro? Yeah, I would rather I would rather Isaac Okoro. He like plays serious minutes. You probably would rather <laughs> Hayes, Hayes Toppin, Abdiar. Uh, you probably would rather Jalen Smith. Would I mean, you? Do you serious? Wait, are you? 
You would rather Killian Hayes than Big Jim. Yeah. Fuck. One of them starting for the Detroit Pistons and one of them isn't. Killian Hayes is so bad. Killian Hayes is like the cockroach of the NBA. Like he's <laughs> somehow still hanging on to his starting job. I don't know if I'd prefer. I, um. Yeah. No. Ob. Ob. Denny. Jalen Smith. Maybe. Like. Yeah. Kira Lewis Jr. You probably would definitely prefer Big Jim to him, right? Nah. Well, it's just because he tore his ACL or he tore he his was, He was bad, and now he's not playing. No, nah, he's still playing. There's so many guys in here that are like actually good NBA players. 15. Colin Anthony. 15, Colin Anthony. 16, Isaiah Stewart. 18, Josh Green. 19, Sadiq Bay. Josh and Green would be nice. Precious right. Achua. Harry's Maxi. Fuck, good draft. Zeke Naji. Oh, yeah. Isaiah Hampton pull one out for him. New Zealand's own. Leandro Belmoro, they're calling the G League. Uh, have you seen this? No. They're calling him the G League manager nobly. Because <laughs> like, he's literally the system in Utah's G League, right? Really? And it's like Eurostep on Eurostep behind the back pass. But then whenever he gets elevated to the team, it's like, can you stand in the corner, man? And he's just not getting the opportunity. Imagine... Um, like being him and growing up in somewhere in Argentina and it's like one day you will be playing second division but you'll be running yeah. a second division <laughs> basketball team yeah. in Salt Lake City, Utah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, have we found anyone we would You think run? he was dreaming about that on the streets of Buenos Aires? <laughs> I would prefer Big Jim over Dirk Azubuki. Yeah, definitely. And he's on your basketball team now. Yeah. Well yeah, he's on it but he's not so, one player in is have we found it's just you, well you said you said Killian Hayes yeah but what about Precious Achua he's kind of shit I, I liked him in Miami <laughs> yeah I've never liked Big Jim anywhere <laughs> yeah if you, if you want a big who's going to shoot 35% from the field yeah but Precious he's Achua he's got he's got a switchy video. body like yeah, Steve Kerr would do something with him yeah. like I would yeah <laughs> Wait, what's, what's he going to do to him I would prefer what's Steve Kerr going to do with his switchy body <laughs> I would I would prefer 28 other players in this first round than I would Big Jim that's funny because you took him second overall let's go to the second round <laughs> This is misery porn at this point. Tyra Terry, you definitely would prefer Big Jim. What was, he what retired was, after one season. But he was like anxiety, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so let's not fucking lump it Do on Do you him. still get the money? No, 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 no. It's, I think it was a bit, it's... Yeah, yeah. Um, because if you retire hurt, like yeah. Lonzo Ball, yeah. he gets the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, he hasn't done it yet yeah but he does let's just yeah. put it out there yeah. um, Tyrell Terry I think because he was the one it wasn't a third party so this is a pretty rough although that's grey area you could get in this. this is a pretty rough start to the second round Tyrell Terry Vernon Carey Jr Daniel Oturu Teo Maladon Xavier Tillman would you prefer Xavier Tillman to Big G definitely but Xavier Tillman's being exposed as not a great starting centre <laughs> bang average um, like Xavier Tillman against uh, reserves is different to Xavier at Tillman least at least general. he's bang average uh, Vit Krejci <laughs> Trey it. Jones oh my god Nick Richards you would rather probably have I didn't know he was tracking Jordan Noir I don't know oh, wait, wait, wait. you're going too <laughs> fast did you you scroll past Marco Simonovic <laughs> uh, the Montenegrin monster oh my god him. Nico Manu Nico Manu Isaiah, Isaiah Joe, Joe. Skylar Mays Justinian playing. Jessup Hey, we still got him. Yeah. <laughs> we might not actually. Killing it. You know, we signed Guy Santos to a contract? Three years, I saw. Yeah. Well, How crazy fully is it that 53 and 54, Cassius Winston, Cassius Stanley? Mm. What are the odds on that? That two blokes called Cassius go back to Last that. time that happened was Kelly Olenek, Jared Salinger. <laughs> Sam Merrill. Yeah, he's been playing. He's and Paul Reed, B ball Paul. Shooting, yeah, B ball Paul. Reggie Perry was drafted four years before this. Why has he been redrafted? <laughs> Um, notable undrafted players? No, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Downton. Tyshawn Alexander, I swear to God. You're thinking of Ty Ty Washington. No, I swear to God, he must be like 27 now. I, when I was watching college basketball, Tyshawn Alexander was like playing at Kansas, maybe. Where was he playing at his... Uh... Hey, we all, we all got that homie that just never finishes their degree, huh? Yeah, fucking <laughs> Imagine his hex I fucking remember fucking this guy six... from way, way back in the day. Six years in school, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, good on him. Uh, well, now that we've gone through the entire 2020 NBA draft, it yeah. seems like probably a, a, a good place. Is a good, a good, I think we can land on the fact that Halliburton was the right pick. Yeah, I think we can. Wait, the right pick for the Phoenix Suns at number 10. Could you imagine <sighs> if we were saying that? 
Um, yeah, James, fucking... James Jones got too much good press for inheriting James, Devil James Booker. Jones has done some incredible, incredible things. And, and he's done some shit fucking stuff. terrible... Yeah. Devin Vassell and Tyrese Halliburton were yeah. the next two picks and he picked Jalen Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Jalen Smith plays for Indiana, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. We traded Jalen Smith after one and a half seasons. Uh, because you declined his third year rookie option. Yep. Um, and then he went into free agency and he wasn't allowed to make more than his third year rookie option. Yep. It's interesting. Um, yeah, it's always nice to have a case study for the rules that we need to understand. Yeah, it's always nice for that case study to wear big funny goggles as well. Oh, well, fuck, let's not, let's not make fun of people who get poked. I'm not making fun of him yeah. at all. I all want right. him to be able to say it's just that it's unique in today's <laughs> NBA. Uh, Dante, I'll speak to you next time. Thanks, Sean. This has been one. The Jeff Van Gundy Tribute Show is your fortnightly dose of the lighter side of basketball, hosted by me, Marco. And me, Lucas. We take a more laid-back approach, talking about the NBA, the WNBA, FIBA basketball, culture, whatever tickles our fancy or grinds our gears. The show is filled with great guests, classic gags, and a healthy dose of tangents in honour of the great man himself. The Jeff Van Gundy Tribute Show, fortnightly on the Deep 2 Podcast Network. You know, loves just talking about the league, certain things like that.